I can give you lots and lots and lots of technical details about how to design a display well. But as you know, when you get involved in display design, you can never do everything you want. Right? And so the question is, where do you fight your battles and where do you say, I give up, let them do it? So let's talk about that. So um, here's some, a list of parameters of displays. And the question is, what really matters a lot and what don't we care about? So wavelength, and by that I'm really referring to color. So this is an old time display where you pretty much got a monochrome image. But basically the color does matter a lot. And the luminance of the display, and the luminance contrast. But direction of contrast, whether it's black on white or white on black, doesn't matter very much, with a few exceptions. And the exceptions in which um, Jake made happen to do with night driving, right? If you're driving at night and you have this um, black characters on a white background, the whole thing is lighting you up. It's just not good for dark adaptation. You get, as he mentioned, all kinds of reflections. It's just a bad idea. But for any other conditions, it doesn't matter which direction the contrast goes. Now, there was a comment about, well, why are e-readers dark characters on like background? Why? Because people want to look like a book. So it looks more like a book if it's that way. That's why they do it. For displays, there are a number of physical parameters that matter geometrically. And basically, for characters, the most important thing is the height. If it's tall enough and you get enough contrast, you're good. Yes, narrow versus wide, that matters, but not as much as height. Height is the big thing. Stroke width, the width of the line, that matters, but not as much as height, et cetera, et cetera. So number one is get the height. And then you want to get all the other things as well. Now let me talk about that more specifically by showing a graphic that's on the next page and going one step past what Jake said. So as I indicated, height matters most. But really, as Jake said, it's not height independent of everything else. Rather, what matters most is this, this angle, this visual angle, the relationship between the distance and height. And if you get the height over distance ratio big enough, you're going to see it. If it's really far away, make it taller. And then you can see the character. This is a topic within human factors that has probably got more studies and more research than any I can think of. I mean, in this one review we did, we found 70 equations there's probably actually about 100 of people that have done experiments and said, as a result of this experiment, here's what our recommendations are. I'm going to give you three from that entire set that I think are characteristic of what's out there and helpful in terms of understanding how big do you need to make something so it can be read. So the first one that's at the bottom of that, page 3-16, is the so-called Peters and Adams formula. And the Peters and Adams work actually came from a report the Naval Air Material Center did in between 1947 and 1953. And there's a little side story about it that I think I should tell to provide some perspective. So I had an old textbook, McCormick, before McCormick was McCormick and Sanders and later Sanders and McCormick, you know, the standard human factors textbook. And McCormick referenced this report. And he provided the equations that I'll talk about in his textbook, right? So it's the most common textbook. I think the same equations may even appear in the Mill Standard, right? All right, where'd these come from? So I gotta find them, how do I get them? Well, I talked to the library, no, we don't have it. Asked around, no, I don't have it. It turned out in this course, a guy named Julian Christensen was teaching. Christensen was one of the founding fathers of our profession. So he said, I'll get you a copy. So he called the Wright Pat Library. Do we have any people here from Wright Pat? Good. Right Pat has always been a center of human factors work. It goes back to the early days. The founding fathers worked there. So he said, oh, the Right Pat Library will have it. No, like Right Pat Library didn't have it. <laughs> so he asked his buddies, and one of his friends found it in the basement of their house. That's the way I got the report. All right. Now, why, did it, why was it worth all this effort to dig out this ancient report? The reason is because if you look at the original experiments, the test conditions are two orders of magnitude different from the test conditions under which they're now applied. Lesson being, 
if you're referring to something, go back and get the original story. Don't look at what somebody says about something about something. Remember the kids game telephone or whispering down the lane? This is a perfect example of where that can occur. Get the original material. All right, so nonetheless, we still use it and it seems to work, but it's kind of a stretch from the data on which it was originally based. So the, this, this expression says the required height is equal to 0.022 times the viewing distance times two correction factors, one of which is in the table in the notes, and that's how you compute the recommended size, and it works pretty well. Now you have to ask, though, what does it mean to say that it's legible? Is it, here it is, I can see it, no sweat, I can read it. Or is it, uh, I think I got it. Or is it, I think it's this, but I'm not really sure. So what's missing from a lot of these expressions is, what's the probability people got it right? And how difficult and how much time did it really take? Uh, there's another expression in the literature that's like this. And let me tell you about the data that was used to generate this expression. The colleague of mine, Sid Smith, many, many years ago was teaching at Northwestern. And Sid said to his classes over the years, go find stuff that people read. Books, newspapers, highway signs, advertising material. Put it up on a wall, get a bunch of people, and his people were all kinds of ages, all kinds of visual acuities, tell them to stand really far away and walk up to it. And when they can read it, tell them to stop and read it. Right? And he generated this function, which indicates the probability that something can be read as a function of visual angle. Now, notice that at some large visual angle, like 007 radians, just about everybody can read it. If you shrink it down to 005, now you're up to like 98 or 99%, right? So therein lies the challenge to you guys. What's the, prob what's the acceptable probability that people can read it? as a function of everything varying, age, lighting conditions, et cetera, et cetera. So can you see why it's so difficult to say how big it really needs to be? Because it depends on all these factors, lighting conditions, accepted error probability, viewing capabilities of viewer, et cetera, et cetera. But the rule of thumb is, if you're at 007, you're good. This has led, led to what's known as the James Bond rule. Uh. Take the distance, multiply it by 007, <laughs> and if you're at least that big, you can be reasonably comfortable that on the wide range of viewing conditions, for a wide range of viewers, people can see it. The James Bond rule. I like that because you can memorize it. Right? Now, will that sometime lead to this, you know, big things that are like, I can't fit it in? Yeah. But all I can say is, if you pass this, you can be darn sure people can read it. All right, but like I said, that might give you predictions that are just going to be way too big. It's like, I just can't make it that big, right? You can be comfortable if people can read it, but like, I just can't make it that big. So at the opposite end of the spectrum is what's known as the NBS method. And let me tell you about the NBS method, named for the National Bureau of Standards because it was under their sponsorship that this method was developed. So the first thing you have to do is you have to compute contrast. And Jake Siegel talked about contrast. Contrast in this case is computed in a particular way. It's the luminance of the background minus the luminance of the target divided by the luminance of the background times 100. Now, where do you get those numbers? You get a spot photometer out, you fire up your display, and you actually measure it. Right? Or you have specs for it, but usually you have to measure it. Oh, this is not easy to do because you need a spot photometer and they cost a few thousand dollars each and you have to know what you're doing. So that's step one. Step two is you have to compute the effective Snellen acuity, which happens to be how well the viewers of this can see. First, you need S sub D, which is the denominator in the Snellen ratio in English units. So remember I talked about, he talked about 2020 and 2040 and 2060, right? It's the 40 or 60 or whatever is in the denominator. So you need to know what is a reasonable worst case visual acuity 
for your viewing population. So now you have to go out and dig up data on how well they can see. And you have to make a decision about how far worst case is worst case. Right? So you might even need statistical distributions on the visual acuity of your viewing population. That's not easy to get. So then you have to take that denominator, multiply, divide 85 by L sub B, the lumens in the background, raise it to the 0 0.2131 power times 90 times the contrast ratio from the previous expression to the 0.5 power. Now, in the uh, bond rule, 007 times distance. Can you do that in your head? Yeah. Can you do this in your head? Well, I actually had a physics professor that could do that because he had memorized the log tables and he did math in his head. Right? Then the last step is you take the height. You know the height to stroke width ratio. So if the height is 8 times the stroke width, that's 8, times 1.45 times n minus 5, times s, the effect of Snellen acuity, times d, the distance. It depends. Sometimes it's smaller. Usually it's smaller. <coughs> but so the advantage of the bond rule is it's quick and easy. But it might give you a number that's bigger than you can acceptably do. This is like, oh, I don't have all the information I need to compute it. Right? So my point is that there are lots and lots of different expressions out there. You need to think about what's the context you're doing, how much you know, and what you don't know, and then do the best you can to find the equation that's appropriate. And realize they're based on different data sets, and they will give you somewhat different recommendations. If you're not sure what to do, bond rule and you're fine. Right? But if it's like, oh, that's, we just can't make it that big. Well, you know, if we calculate more precisely what should it be, what should that number be? Well, here's an example of a way to do it.